Hey everyone, good evening. Um, I'm here with Thunderous, and our topic today is atheism. So today, this is more of Thunderous's talk. Uh, he's when I first really met him, he was someone who was very clued up on atheism. I heard him speak on Thaddeus's channel, and I was very, very impressed. So I thought I would be happy to have him talk on the topic. And uh, Thunderous, how are you doing? Hi everybody. Hi. How's yourself? Um... Uh, Lloyd, I know you've been a very busy man. We're working with um, other channels, which is good to see. So, how are you? You must be very f flat out and tired by now. Actually, I am. <laughs> it's been it's been a very busy time. Um, just so everyone knows, um, let me actually just skip over. Let me just move over here. Um, yeah, I've actually been. I've actually started. I have extensive notes. I haven't finished them all, but I have started uh, today. But I will be talking about. Darwin and the Third Reich in the near future. So I've had these notes for some time, and I'm just busy prepping to talk about Darwin, Darwinian ideology. How, in fact, Darwin's lecturer at Cambridge or Darwin's mentor at Cambridge wrote to him, and one of the sentiments he expressed is that he thought that Darwin had deliberately created his ideology to undermine the Bible and undermine Christianity, and he told Darwin that. He thought that this this thing that he had done, this idea that he had created, would undermine basic morality and lead man into an era of death, and he did. So yeah, so so that's something that I thought would be. So I will be talking about this. So you know, I'll be discussing this. So these are some of the slides. I've got quite a bit to do. This is only part one. I'm at slide twenty three. It'll probably be about fifty slides. That'll be part one, and um, part two will be even more extensive. It'll be so. This is like an introduction to Darwin, and then I will be doing Darwin and Hitler. So even though this talks about the Third Reich, it's more about Darwin, less about Hitler. But the second part will be leaning toward. It's really more Darwin. Uh, your thoughts, Thunders, and um, yeah, and then no, you can tell us what you want to talk about today. Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't think it can be underestimated the influence of Darwinian evolution. Um, I, I, for me personally, uh, when you look at history. Um, I tend to look at things from the Industrial Revolution moving forward. And it's interesting to know that in the 18th century, how many people wrote certain things that were ideas that are formulated or postulations that are did, um, thought out in the um, 18th century, which are now mainstream science today, um, and, and influences that have manipulated themselves into other areas. And I'm no doubt that in the coming weeks and months, you, you, know, you and I are going to be talking about such things. So Mary Sanger is one example. I think for yeah. the audience, um, just so that they know, um, Lloyd and myself met several years ago on actually another channel, but we lost communication. Um, we reunited via Thaddeus, and this is the subject that Th uh, Lloyd and myself have wanted to do for some time, is Darwinian evolution, how it hides behind atheism. Atheism is something people say that they're an atheist, but when you press an atheist as to how they view science and how they view the world, their own origins and the origins of the universe, they will normally default to Darwinian evolution. So the reality is that when you speak into an atheist, they're not actually an atheist, not in the slightest. What they are is an evolutionist. Now, in a, um, which which comes across like a religion, doesn't it? If you say that's where your faith it's the, is. It's the Genesis definition. story told without God. It's creation without God. Exactly that. If that's where you're putting your faith, that's what your religion is by by very definition. Okay. Now, they will say that there's no such word as an evolutionist. Well, I don't know if you can screen share and Google this for me, um, uh, Lloyd. Evolutionist. And you'll actually come up with a definition. So by implication, you have to ask the question, okay, then, so which came first, evolution or atheism? Well, for the evolutionist or the atheist, evolution came first. So if evolution came first, then that's what you are by implication. You're not actually an atheist, an, an, an atheist you're an evolutionist. Now, the reason why I mentioned the 18th century is because you've got Darwin's evolution, but you've also got things like, I think, it's, is it um, Charles Lyle who wrote the ge about the geological column? You also have um, um, Francis Galton who wrote um, eugenics. So it's interesting that you've got three 
writings in the 18th century, which go on to then become the foundation of modern day biology as we see it today, spoken of and espoused through the media, it's certainly um, political um, um, uh, circles uh, in the school, youth college and universities uh, curriculum as well. It's like a sacred cow that cannot be challenged. Correct. You, you are not allowed to challenge Darwinian evolution. It is, it is an anathema for it to be challenged. Okay. Yet the irony is, is when you look at, say, um, Darwinian evolution, and for those who have got experience with speaking to Muslims, you'll find that even though the subject is different, Islam and evolution, they couldn't be more opposite to each other. Yet for the, somebody who accepts the biblical narrative as a reality, the arguments in Yad Hominin are exactly the same. Both appeal to science, yet both of them, when you look at the very definition of what science means, which is postulating something, testing something, and seeing what the results are, mm -hmm. neither of them have science behind to back them up. When you consider that both of them claim to have a, any kind of sense of morality, Islam says it's the cure for mankind and the, the solution for humanity, anyone with any, even entry-level entry intellect will see that Islam has no morality about it, not in the slightest, not on your nelly. When you look at, say, Darwinian evolution, the Darwinian point of view is there is nothing beyond the material. I mean, one of the things that um, we discussed before we came on the air earlier on today was about watching a video of um, Richard Dawkins. Mm -hmm. I've actually uploaded it to my channel today. Uh, one of them, anyway. And for for everybody, for anybody that's new to the show or listening to me for the first time, I've had two of my um, YouTube channels deleted in the past. My second one, which was very much an attack on Darwinian evolution. Um, got deleted. I'm not sure why, perhaps they didn't like the material, but I'm going to, if the audience can make some comments <coughs> um, in the show notes and certainly in the comments after the show, if they want to see more material, then I'll make the effort to do it. But I went extensively through it last time, put some up, got deleted, got disheartened by it. But if people are interested in the subject, I'll do it all again. And there are some yeah, examples of the material I'll pull up today, including people, one subject yeah, that will be gone. Oh, sorry, no, just some people oh, sorry, are getting no, some bandwidth issues. Um, yeah, there's not much I can do about that. I'm just running a bandwidth test. Um, it has rained here in Warsaw, which does seem to affect the internet. Uh, but on your discussion of morality, just a few quotes. As I said, I'm, I'm, I only started on these slides today. So it says here, the war of annihilation is a natural law without which the organic world could not continue to exist at all. That's German zoologist Gustav Jäger in 1870. Because Darwin's ideas really took root in Germany. Just as in nature, yeah. the struggle for existence is the moving principle of evolution and perfection. So the struggle for existence is the moving principle of evolution. So also in world history, the destruction of the weaker nations through the stronger is a postulate of progress. And that's German ethnologist Friedrich Helwald in 1875. And according to Darwin's theory, wars have always been of the greatest importance for the general progress of the human species. The physically weaker, the less intelligent, the morally lower must give place to the stronger. Now, the scary part is, uh, let me share this with you. Hold on, let me share my screen with you, Thunder, so you can at least see what I have going. Okay, there it is. Is that who decides? Yeah. So... Well, check it on YouTube then, because it will also be playing on YouTube. Yeah, so, I mean, this is what Darwin's ideas have led to. Also, let me see. Um, actually, Darwin states in one of his books that he states here, for instance, this is a quote, this is a letter that Darwin wrote to a German um, scientist called W. Prayer, I believe, in 1868. Darwin states very bluntly, the support which I receive from Germany is my chief ground for hoping that our views will ultimately prevail. And then he says, the younger naturalists are almost all on my side, and sooner or later the public must follow all of those who make the subject their special study. So he knew that he had to push this idea into the universities. Yeah, I, I think it, it, I think we discussed this previously as well, um, several months ago, uh, where I quoted the book, The War on God. Um, perhaps I'll dig out that quote, I wasn't expecting to discuss it tonight, where this actually goes back historically where um, to the about 17th century in France, where they wanted to get into the education system and um, have this kind of like um, anti-God, 
and then obviously when because um, Darwin isn't the originator of um, origin of the species, Erasmus Darwin, his father was also a propo uh, somebody who very much wanted to promote this no God, everything is natural uh, point of view. So it does it, Darwin, Charles Darwin's become, say, the main, the poster guy for this, but he's not the originator of this. He's merely the poster guy. Moving forward. But, but when you look at, say, the people that are um, supporting him, quoting him, if you like, and wanting to be inclined to um, draw closer to him, they're pretty much people of the same social standing. So that is more the educated and the elite. And who are they really speaking about? It is the people, people at the bottom end of the totem pole, uh, people that they will consider pebs, plebs, or people right. that will consider um, not, you know, that, that were detrimental to society, people of no account. It's very much like the Pharisees' attitude to um, the poor and downtrodden in Jerusalem. They call them the Amharats, you know, the people of the ground. Well, they were the people of concern. Well, the very first genocide of the 20th century was committed by the Germans in what was called Southwest Africa, today Namibia. And it's against a group called the Herero. And the man that did it, the General von Trocha, used explicitly Darwinist terminology because they divided humans into those who were viable economically and those who were not, those who had worth and those who didn't. And the Herero were not seen as having of any value. And thus, it was okay to exterminate them. So they murdered, I think, a quarter million of them. And this was inspired by the very first genocide of the 20th century, was inspired by Darwinism. And then, of course, you go on to World War I, which inspired by Darwinism and World War II as well. And then, then subsequently, um, democide, which is the murder of uh, by a government of its own people, which, which we've seen in communist China, we've seen communist Russia, we've seen in communist um, uh, Cambodia and other locations as well have all been inspired by um, Darwinian evolution. There's a principle. I would, there's a couple of things I want to mention um, from the outset as far as the biblical narrative point of view is concerned. One of them is um, scripture in Genesis, no, not Genesis, Revelation, verse 18, uh, chapter 18, verse 4. Um, give me a moment. I'm actually going to quote it if I may. Um, Lawyer, are you okay with that? Revelation 8, so you said Revelation? Chapter 18, verse 4, and it's a principle. We're not going to um, discuss who Babylon is. We're looking at what is God's point of view and why we consider it this way. So it says there, um, let me just get, uh, I'm using the Young's literal translation, and it reads here, And I heard a voice come out of heaven, Come forth out of her, my people, that ye may not partake of her sins, and ye may not receive of her plagues. So what does that actually mean? Well, every, well, in the Bible, God is speaking of Babylon the Great. We're not interested in that subject at the moment. We're just looking at the principle of God is saying to people, get out from Babylon, otherwise you're going to share in her sins and you're going to receive her plagues. Well, why is God condemning one thing, but also the people are going to go along with it? That if you don't get out of this, whatever this Babylon is, you're going to go down with it. And the principle is a thing called um, communal or um, yeah, communal responsibility. OK, what, what that means is if you sign up to something or if you're a part of something or if you support something, then from God's point of view, you you are a part of it. You, you are with it. it. It wouldn't exist unless it got your support. So when God brings judgment against it, you're going down with it. For instance, you could turn around and say things like, um, well, when God brings judgment, there are 1.7 billion human beings who identify as Islam, uh, as Muslims. But what's God's point of view? Well, when God brings judgment, they're going down with the religion of Islam. Of course they are, because they are Islamic adherents. But there are good people in there. That may well be the case. But they identify with something that is a blatant apostasy towards God. So ignorance is not um, a privilege that people can just quote. It's not a, a privilege. It's an oblivion. So the principle of what I'm trying to raise here is that if you say that you're an atheist, if you're going to identify as such, then you are accountable for the historical histori uh, uh, atrocities that have been done in the ide ideology that you claim to be um, an adherent of or something that you subscribe to. So it's not a case of I have my own version of atheism. It doesn't quite work like that. If you're basically saying you're an atheist and you identify using yourself using that word, then by definition, you're going down with it from, from a God, or you're associated with it and you're going to go down with it from a godly point of view, just the same as any other ideology that is a blasphemy in God's eyes.
Yeah. Does I just want to just a hold on a second. I just want to make a note. Um, S. P. Jones, you stated that the first genocide of the 20th century was the Armenian genocide, which is 1915, and the Herero genocide is 1904 to 1907. So I'm not very good at maths because I grew up in Africa, but I think this one is bigger than this one. That's just my thinking on the matter. Yeah, sorry, go on, go on, Thunders. Yeah. Yeah, so um, there's co there's communal um, responsibility that has to take place for people who identify with an ideology as such. But as we've said, if you press an, an atheist on what they believe, they will go to Darwinian evolution. That is their default. So as far as I'm concerned, you're a Darwinian evolutionist. You're a, you're an evolutionist, and this is something else that people have to understand as well. If you depending on what kind of you, I know you, Lloyd, read the same books as I do. Uh, particularly on the intelligent design counter argument to Darwinian evolution, which has a lot more credibility and by definition science to support it. And when you read those books, you actually start to understand that um, the, the lies that are spoken of in Darwinian evolution to support it, so much so that we're right. now going into a point of time where we are actually where this, the scientific field that are basically against God or against the idea of intelligent design are having to formulate a new idea, a new argument, because the, the Darwinian model has failed utterly now. We're no further forward since Charles Darwin wrote Origin of the Species to today, it's over 150 years later, we are no further forward in proving whether um, Darwinian evolution is even possible. I There's think we're, we're further, probably, further. look, um, this is not my expertise, yeah, the not, science of it. But I, from what I've watched and seen, it's the way further away, and it doesn't make yes. any sense. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the suggestion. I mean, here's another um, thing that people could do when they're um, when they've got five minutes. Type into your Google um, search bar um, geological column location on Earth. That's all you got to do. Then go to images, and tell me what you see. So do that as an experiment now. Mm -hmm. Geological column, location on Earth, then go to Google Images. What's the term I should type in? Geological column, location on Earth. Oops. And what are we looking for? I go to Images. What do you see? What do you see? You notice that? You, I said geological column location on Earth. Why are we seeing artistic impression? That's the point. You've got it there. That's it, Lloyd. That's it. That's all we need. <laughs> Why is it? Where is it? Where is the location on Earth? You're not seeing any location on Earth. All you're seeing is an image, a, a cartoon, Cartoons. A, a painting, a drawing, a speculation. Why? Why is that? You know why that is? Because it doesn't exist anywhere on Earth. It's a fraud invented in the 1850s by Charles Lyle, a Scottish uh, lawyer. So all okay, that, Jurassic. That's interesting. You know, a Scottish lawyer. You know, it's just just so uh, by sheer coincidence, John Calvin's a lawyer, and and maybe someone in the audience can actually help me out with this and and correct me if I'm wrong or find me the evidence. If you, Martin Luther went to university to study law. Now I find conflicting stories in this, but I find a lack of information. So what I'm learning is that Martin Luther was like John Calvin was also a lawyer, right? Remember John Calvin was a lawyer, didn't qualify as a theologian to my knowledge, right? He did qualify as a lawyer, which means he learned how to make arguments and rebuttals and such. Twist words, if you will. But Luther also qualified as a lawyer, except back in the day, you didn't get a law degree because the law, there was no proper law faculty and a, and a legal degree was issued through the through the philosophy faculty. So you got your master's in philosophy, you got your bachelor's in philosophy, then your master's. He received both his bachelor's in, eight, in uh, 1502, I think, and then in 1505, he got his master's. So they say, well, he qualified in philosophy, but apparently that was that that philosophy degree was your legal de degree because they didn't have a a fully recognized legal um degree but that was so if someone can find out or knows more about it please let me know so it's interesting lawyers that are very good at, at you know making arguments so just thought maybe that's relevant and I, 
And, and I don't think it's um, a coincidence either, Lloyd, that you should bring up that, that when we see certain things entering the educational system, that they're enter entering into it via a legal system or a legal mandate or a legal loophole or a manipulation of language in order to get it uh, put in. There's something else as well for those who um, accept the biblical narrative is that how can these things happen on, a, on, on earth and, and be done with immunity and impunity? What's the source behind it? Well, for anybody that accepts the biblical narrative, you have to accept that Genesis is telling us a very real story about two human beings that God placed in the Garden of Eden. That is a real account. I don't take it as um, some kind of allegory to something else. For me, Adam and Eve are real people. When you listen to Paul, when certainly when you listen to Jesus, Jesus himself quoted Adam when he said he who created me beginning, he made a male and female. That is why what God has put together, let no man is put to part. Paul um, refers to um, Jesus as the last Adam. Paul also talks about just as death entered into the world through one man, we gain life through one man. So the biblical narrative, without going too much into it, has Adam and Eve as real people. They weren't at some point some kind of chemicals that came together in a primordial swoop, uh, soup, um, no croutons obviously in that soup, and then developed into a cell that developed into a trilobite, that developed into a fish, that developed into a, um, an amphibian, that developed into a ro um, uh, reptile, and then the reptile developed into birds, mammals, and more reptiles. Uh, we won't talk about the plants because we don't know how that happened, but there was already food on the land for them to eat when they got out there. And obviously these creatures had a fantastic digestive system to digest that food and they knew what to eat, but we'll discuss that at another time. The point I'm getting at is that uh, for, for those who accept the biblical narrative, it's really, it hasn't helped many people in, um, that's in, in, in the Christian congregations where certain churches have now accepted and adopted um, Darwinian evolution as true. Notably two, I'll mention, the Catholic Church, which put out a story where the Pope himself referred to people as um, taking the biblical in the 2005 Times newspaper, which I have cut out, and the um, Church of England also said that the uh, evolution account is true and that the is allegorical. So why are we mentioning all of this? What, what has that got to do with the discussion and where Lloyd and myself want to go with all of this? Sorry, well, Anders, that... you're, you're breaking up a little bit. Your connection is fading in and out. Okay, yeah, so just, just hold in a second, Thunderous. Danny, um, there's a guy called Danny in the chat. Now, Danny, it's, a, it's an article of faith of the religion of atheism because atheism is at least within the US, atheism is legally recognized. Atheists went to court, atheist organizations went to court multiple times, went to the high court, and in the US, atheism is legally recognized as a religion, as is secular humanism. They're both recognized as religions. So you are all religious atheists. And modern atheism dates to the French Revolution, to the time of the philosophers of the Enlightenment. And these ideas that are present within atheism today, the doctrine, the dogma within atheism, those are long established, about 250 years approximately. And many of those state that atheism is explicitly a religion. In fact, it's a replacement religion. It just, it simply redefines who God is. You become God. So there is a difference. It's a, Sorry, yeah? a, a, excellent point. Excellent point, Lloyd, because what you've just said there is that man replaces God and then man makes laws on, and sets his morality in his own image rather than follow the objective laws set out by God himself. The interesting thing is with Danny, you you, you know, you, you people like um, they, they use pejoratives. Oh, you lot need a sky daddy. It's a sky daddy religion. OK, fine. You can mock me with that little ad hominem. I'll take that. Right, I, I, I don't believe in magic, and you do, see, because in your worldview as an atheist, well, you're not actually an atheist, you're an evolutionist, so don't dress yourself up in a suit that doesn't fit, you're actually an evolutionist, and in your model, the universe came from nothing. The only person I know that can make something come from nothing is a magician, so you believe in magic. Then you've got life coming from non-life. If anything is a miracle, son, that's a miracle. And then you have life producing so many varieties of species and vegetation with no evidence. That's a mystery. So yes. you've got magic, miracles, and mystery. And you've got no yeah. evidence for it, and that's where you put your faith in. You call me the fool? Have a word with yourself, son. Yeah. 
Um, welcome, Harriel. Thank you very much for signing up, for joining. Um, I really do appreciate the support. Um, also, for, for Danny, for Danny's information, when you go through, so this is my slide deck here that I've got on about, it goes through about 80 different definitions from the world's major atheist scholars. We're talking PhD scholars at university, most of them lecturers who've written major textbooks who contributed to works like the Oxford Companion to Philosophy, to the Gold Standard, which is the, the um, Princeton, um, uh, the Princeton uh, Guide to Philosophy. And they will tell you bluntly that atheism is a doctrine, right? It is a doctrine. A doctrine is not a lack of belief. It's not a psychological state because atheism is a continuous doctrine. It's a set of ideas, a set of beliefs, an organized ideology. When you go through that, so this is something that is very much accepted within academia. And if you're merely a lack of belief, then it's not a scientific position, right? Because a lack of belief, just a feeling, is not, is not a truth statement. It cannot be true, it cannot be false, it just is. So then how can you claim atheism is a scientific position? It is merely, quite literally, ignorance. Thunderous, back to you. I think that first of all, anybody that wants to quote science needs to, uh, who is a, um, a Darwin or atheist, and that's my own word, the Franken word, Darwin or atheist, yeah. um, they need to look up the word science and then tell me what it means and then see if it applies to their worldview yeah. because it doesn't. But also, if, you, if it's just a lack of belief, then it needs to supplement what, what it loses by not having access to religious ideas. It needs to now supplement with other ideas, so it now has to adopt additional ideas, ideas from somewhere else. So therefore, it has to borrow. So it's not just a lack of belief. It now needs to find other views to support its worldview. Atheism is the doctrine, right? And these arguments are directed against the Christian God. So, and that's just continuous. Sorry, right. Go on again. Uh, and, 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 so go on. No, no, no. Go. You go. Um, what I was going to say was as well is that when you when you speak to a Darwin or atheist as well, uh, and you compare that to somebody who looks at the biblical narrative, f fine, I, I can accept that there might be um, points of uh, disagreement. So let's look at the Genesis account. Nobody would challenge that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's a clear statement of who did what, where, and, uh, and when. Okay, who did what, where, when, and when, uh, where and when. Also, when you consider the, the, the point, so nobody will argue with that, but you'll find some that may say, well, was, were the seven days literally 24 hours? Were there a thousand years um, each day? Or was it an unspecified period of time that could have mean many hundreds of thousands or millions of years? That's where the disagreements can come in, and I can accept that. I may differ with you, Lloyd, on the seven days, whether literal or figurative. I think we do. <laughs> I, think, I, 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 I think we probably do. But what we they're, they're kind of like minor. They're not salvation issue disagreements, really, are they? They're just minor disagreements based on what, what, what we can interpret. However, when you speak to a Darwin or atheist and you say, what about the origins of the universe? I mean, going by what Dr. David Belinsky wrote in his book, um, The Devil's Delusion, um, Atheistic and the Scientific Pretensions, which I've read, and I think you've read that as well. You know, which which version of the origin of the universe are you speaking about? Are you speaking about the one where the universe just popped into existence by magic and then it's going to spread out and then the, the, the force of the universe expanding is going to move celestial objects away from each other so the universe basically, or certainly planet Earth, is going to freeze? Or are you the one that believes where the universe will stretch to a certain point and then it will contract and go back to the infinitely dense singularity, which means Earth will blow and burn up or are you the atheist that turns around and says or darwin or atheist that turns around and says well i believe in the oscillating universe where it goes just, in just, out in out in out just pause a moment um danny tells us that the days refer to daniel the third by the days refer to trillions of years so it's obvious uh daniel uh no it's not trillions the the commonly accepted scientific consensus is 13.8 billion yes. so so no, no, not trillions. There's no support for trillions. But that, that, but that figure has changed over the past 60 years as well, uh, Lloyd. That's just the figure that we have now. But probably if the system went on for another 100 years, we may have a different figure. It might be only 10 or 5 billion years old. Yeah, because but based on, I mean, just based on current state of science, this is this is what it is. Yeah. So. But, but since 2017, we've had the James White um, telescope go into um, space. 
and is looking further than what Hubble has done, and that will be yielding different results than what Hubble has been able to do thus far. So that that number will change, but it doesn't matter what the number is. We we you know we're talking about the origin of the universe. I'm I'd like to know if um, amongst the um, opinions so far, um, do this do these Darwinian atheists all because they have the other version, which is the universe inside the universe. Or the other version is where they have a machine spitting out different di um, multiverses. Mm -hmm. So which one is it that they believe in? So when when you speak to a Darwin or atheist, they like to mock the, you know the, the creationists and those who, who support intelligent design. Well, I just counter argue. Well, which Mickey Mouse version of the universe do you believe in? Because as Dr. David Belinsky put it, anything is better than nothing. Nothing is better than God. And that's what we're coming down to. An atheist will extrapolate to believe anything which is fanciful, uh, sort of like um, the, the buzz belief um, of the universe for that moment, and then will adopt something else, whereas the creationist is pretty much sitting on the same fence, yeah. sort of same seat if, and foundation. If I can just interrupt you for a second. I want to go back to, this is again to Danny. Um, so, Danny, I, what I did was, as I told you, I collected something like 80 quotes from the very best scientific sources available, including the top atheists in the world, PhD scholars, lecturers at Princeton, Harvard, Cambridge, so on, Oxford and whatnot. This is Jordan Sobel in the textbook. You can see it's a Cambridge textbook called Logic and Theism, Arguments for and Against Belief in, Beliefs in God. And uh, Danny, you are a tedious pain you are clearly not listening. These are scientists. They do study atheism. Atheism is a massive field of study. You are clearly ignorant. This is, this is Jordan Sobel. If one takes up the task of providing sound arguments for atheism, formidable difficulties arise. It is much easier to punch holes in theistic arguments than to actually argue for truth of atheism. This is in Logic and Atheism, Arguments for and Against Beliefs in God, Cambridge, 2009, and he was at the University of Toronto. Before his death, Sobel was considered the leading philosophical defender of atheism prior to Graham Oppie. Let's continue with what he says here. When the latter is undertaken, that's a defense of atheism, we find that the needs of and the problems of the atheist are parallel to those of the theist. To impose the same argumentative restrictions upon the atheist is to, is to show that the position is at least as inadequately defended as theism. Whatever the reason for its widespread acceptance, atheism is no less a matter of faith than theism. So, now, do we accept you, who is a Reddit-level atheist, or do we accept Dr. Jordan Howard Sobel, PhD, who apparently was teaching, having this taught at Cambridge. Go on, Thunders. Thanks. Yeah, so I forgot where, what, where I was and my train of thought. I was just distracted by what you brought up there. So, go, yeah, so, so Danny mentions the comment that I've been um, speaking to, or basically, theists, basically speaking to Facebook um, atheists. But that's where they all are. Where, you know, when, when you're speaking to an atheist, who do you think I'm speaking to? Of course, I'm speaking to the layman atheist. But then you're making out as if to suggest that atheism has its own code or its own sort of set of um, objective ru ru uh, rules or values or scientific um, structure. But you don't. You don't have anything of the like. So in effect, atheism or Darwinian atheism is a free for all. So obviously, I'm going to um, attack any kind of avenue that I'm going to see because that's very much what you're doing to the theist you attack. So we're just reciprocating the response now. But let me just bring out something else in, in, in all of this. Okay, when you're speaking to a Darwin or atheist, they will often hide behind people like Sobel or um, Christopher Hitchens or Sam Harris or um, the, the great Druid himself, um, uh, Richard Dawkins. But what they're in effect doing is hiding. They're hiding behind a thing called gatekeeping. And I actually uploaded a, um, a video on my channel today, um, Noam Chomsky, intellectual gatekeeper. And it's a fascinating insight into how gatekeeping works, where you have academic gatekeeping, authoritative gatekeeping, positional gatekeeping, where people hide behind their credentials or their authority 
And it's almost like they put up a bulwark that you can't get past. And you, what you'll find is people like Daniel will turn and say, well, I've read this book by this um, atheist. I've read this by that. I don't care what you've read. It's about whether the argument stacks. If the argument doesn't stack, then it doesn't matter who you quote. And hiding behind some guy because he's got credentials doesn't really mean anything. You've got two people in a room. One of them is saying that organic soup came together and produced the first cell. One mm. man says, no, it didn't. And you prove it. Well, which were both of them have got university credentials. Both of them have got PhDs. Both of them are professors. So which academic keeping are you going to hide behind? Well, what you're really doing is you're just hiding behind your presupposition and your quote mining for the argument that you've gone with. That's all you're doing. I'm going with the science. Right. Um, yeah, just, just to maybe go through some of these. For instance, this is Carl Sagan, who tells us an atheist is someone who is certain that God does not exist. Now, clearly Carl Sagan doesn't know what an atheist is because an atheist is just someone who lacks a belief. And he says, an atheist is someone who has compelling evidence against the existence of God. But then he goes on to say, I know of no such compelling evidence. And that's in the conversations with Carl Sagan, um, interview with Edward Waken. That's, uh, you know, so that's the, the book here. So Carl Sagan seems to not have as much knowledge as Danny. So, so how are we getting um, through in all of this? Well, the point being, if you start having an education system that basically teaches that you're not made in God's image, you're not valuable, and uh, there are no yeah. objective um, moral values, all you are is just advanced form of bacteria, because that's what we came from. So a teacher will be using a curricular system to point to a child and basically say, you're nothing, you're worthless. All you are is just a result of lots of chemical reactions and actions that have taken place from a universe that came from nothing. So the universe came from nothing, um, the periodic table and time came about from nothing, and then a bunch of chemicals came together, and eventually, after some time, out came you. When you've got an education system that basically devalues and um, sort of like lowers the value of a human being and re reduces them to being nothing more than a mere animal, what are you expecting that human being to then go on and do? When you've got an education system that starts promoting that, and you're, what, in effect, you're doing is you're undermining objective theistic values. Now, irrespective of um, any kind of religious identity, if you the further back in time you go, religion or objective theistic moral values served as a bulwark against um, outside influences that were damaging to society. I'll give an example. In the 40s and the 50s, if a woman got pregnant right, and she wasn't married, she was a whore or a slut or a, or a hussy, the child would have been born and he would have been called a bastard. Now, that's a pejorative. It's not a, a positive. It's a pejorative. As you move forward, um, you start getting things like um, people living together. Well, they're living in sin. That used to be a phrase back in the 40s, 50s and 60s, living in sin. The child is a bastard. Um, then, then you start with your know, shotgun wedding is another thing. What has happened to society is to remove all of these phrases? Well, what's happened is, is that when you start removing objective theistic moral values from society and you start replacing it with um, subjective Darwinian evolution as, a, as the scientific base and you promote the moral value, um, well, lack of moral values through atheism, that's where we get to the way we have the world today. And what's, what is actually taking place in the world today? I mean, you and I have discussed this before, Lloyd. Uh, are you familiar with what's taking place in Canada and um, euthanasia laws? Well, those are the things what, what, at the Nuremberg what, trials that the Nazis were put on trial for and sentenced to death for, which is what, what, the, what the Canadian government is doing today and calling it legal. It was illegal when the Nazis did it. Yeah, so what they're doing now is... Uh, okay, they're, just they're hold on a second. Um, Thunderous, do you think Danny is actually providing any value? I mean, he's just in denial and... I don't see how this is of any value to the conversation. What's he saying? Wasting my time. So, why is know, it here? Look, no, but Dan, Danny, you, you, I mean, from your world point of view, can I just say, you're conceived and you're going to die. You've got no point or of existence. Even your own druid um, guru, Richard Dawkins, says that there is no point in life unless you're passing on DNA to replicate yourself. So why are you here? Shouldn't you be busy going out finding some woman to replicate your DNA? Because that's the only point you exist. You have no reason to be sitting in a discussion with uh, theists 
Okay. And the interesting thing is, if you're going to start uh, bashing people who believe in God, where did the objective um, morals come from? Why, where did this abstract concept of God come from? If you, if you look at your own Darwinian evolution model, why did evolution allow the human being to evolve to such a point that it, it, it imagined it, it um, created an abstract concept of God, which is diametrically opposed to, what, to its own origins? So if you're going to start mocking people who believe in God, well, they only believe in God because Darwinian evolution wanted them to believe in God in the first place. Do you not see how stupid your argument is? I believe in God. From your point of view, I believe in God because Darwinian evolution wanted me to believe in God. That's what I evolved to do. Have you got an answer for that, Dan? Yeah. I mean, look, atheists will tap on tonight. Look, my philosophy on this may go against the American idea of free speech, but they are free to go speak somewhere else. If someone had to take a pee on my doorstep, they might find themselves waking up in the expensive care ward because really these are people that are abusing the right of free speech. They're simply using those rules against you. You are merely allowing and enabling enemies to spout propaganda. I have no interest in listening to propaganda, right? They are not arguing in good faith. They're not trying to make coherent arguments, they are merely using sophistry to run riot, to run wild. The whole point is you are in a war and you need to understand the other side is your enemy and they are lying to you. They understand how you work, they've observed you, they've crafted ideas and arguments designed to undermine and destroy your logic. They're not operating on the basis of logic, therefore your job is to make sure that their message does not get out. I'm not banning them on YouTube. I'm just not allowing them to talk poop on my channel. The whole point is you get your message out. So somewhere else you can do what you like. However, I am not going to allow those people free reign on my channel. Okay, wild animals need to be put in zoos, not run free. And these ideas have consequences. These ideas are toxic. These ideas have caused the worst genocide in recorded history since the recording of history began. Atheism in government has murdered more people in the 20 in 87 years in the 20th century than in the previous 7000 years yep. before it so th this is really i mean well, at least in the previous 1900 years prior to that this we know so no i'm not allowing this to i'm not allowing these people to run free on my channel i have my message i'm interested in my message not their message they can go spot that somewhere else Done respect to you. Well, I, I don't mind if Danny wants to continue because the thing I was going to turn around and say is if you are, and I, was, I do this with, particularly with men, and I'll do it in front of other men. And I've, I, I gave an example of this when I was interviewed by uh, Mr. Thurliot um, a couple of years ago on his channel. And it's, it's what's known as reductio ad absurdum. And so I'll go mm -hmm. to the Darwin or atheist and I'll say, You got a daughter? They'll say, Yes. And I'll say, Well, how many cocks do you want inside your daughter before I say enough's enough? 20, 30? 40, because in your worldview, there's nothing wrong with that. How many different children do you want your daughter to have by different men? Three, four, five? What difference does it make? How, how many abortions would you like your daughter to have before you think enough's enough? How many sexually transmitted diseases would you like her to experience before you say enough's enough? Because in your worldview, because there is no morality, it's all subjective, from your point, from your worldview, there's nothing wrong with that. Or let's look at the stupid people that believe in God who say one man should marry one woman, they should stay together and unite, um, work at their marriage and have children only amongst themselves. Which one would you rather have? And I've yet to meet a man turn around and say, I'd rather have the atheistic point of view, the Darwinian atheist point of view for my daughter uh, over having the one man. It's interesting that the inclination of every human being is towards theism, though they reject it. They reject the idea of a God, but they don't reject the, the rules and the objective morality that God gives mankind. That Isn't is actually that a very strange? interesting That's... argument. Because, yeah, I mean, also, I thought the whole point of matter was to procreate. You know, the whole selfish gene story was to procreate as opposed to, you know, so what's the point of abortion then? Oh, and just by the way, so everyone, <laughs> someone just came up with a new name for Luther on my channel. Someone left this comment calling him Lax Luther. 
<laughs> because of the letter where Luther writes to his friend to ask him for laxatives because Luther suffered throughout his life from constipation. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is superb. Veronica, <laughs> you just won the internet today. <laughs> oh my gosh, Lax Luther, this is brilliant. This is, yeah, she, she wins the internet today. So, oh man. S.D. Jones writes an interesting point. He says, the guy who wrote Universe from Nothing, Lawrence Krauss, admitted he found nothing wrong with incest. That's actually quite true because I remember that as well. I mean, but they're, they're counter... But I think what they've gone on to say is because as long as incest doesn't produce children, for example, you couldn't have a father have sex with his own daughter or a mother have sex with their own son or brother and sister because yeah. that might produce children that would that would that would have offspring that are going to be negative but the darwinists yes. actually started to inbreed because they felt that they were the superior genetic race yes. and therefore they would produce the superior species and of course the, this led to um i mean genetic you know issues let's just say hillbillies well, yeah, it, as harriel said it, 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 but was it, wasn't it Charles Darwin and um, Francis Galton's families united? I think it was it theirs or was two others. Yeah. Uh, and it, in effect, that his own children had health problems. And yeah, I think Darwin himself had health issues. So it's interesting they talk about the survival of the fittest when they weren't really very fit human beings. Neither did their progeny. Didn't sorry, neither did their progeny. Um, be born with any kind of superior intellect or physical ability. They seem to be degenerates themselves. And was it not um, Karl Marx? He had six children, three of them died, and two of them committed suicide? Um, he, he, he let a couple of his babies starve to death because he failed to feed them. And then he encouraged his daughters, I believe, um, through his writings, to commit suicide. And two of them <laughs> did commit suicide, yeah. Yeah, yeah, what great heroes they are to the atheistic movement, eh? Yeah. No, the... Um, so, when, when, so, so, the, so to, to look at all of this, like what we're seeing in the world today with this woke movement, is everything that you're seeing in the world today seems to be a, di a diametrically opposite challenge to the Bible. For instance, when you're talking about conception, the book of Psalms talks about um, David writes, you know, you saw the embryo of me. In your book, all its parts were written down. But the evolution, the Darwinian evolutionist says, no, it's just a bunch of cells. You know, you can have it, it's just a fetus. Not understanding what the Latin word fetus means, they just use this word as if it's some kind of pejorative, and it's not. It actually means offspring. For instance, a puppy is offspring, a kitten is offspring, a lamb is offspring, thus a baby is offspring. So they are actually using baby, or the word baby, but they don't understand what the Latin word means. But yeah. going back to the point, so the yeah. Bible makes it clear that life is valuable and God is the source of life, but the world and the atheistic world is saying, well, no, it's not. It's valueless and you can just abort it. The world, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created a male and female. But what are we seeing in the world today now? What we're seeing is no, ignore that Bible rubbish. You're not a boy or a girl. You can decide what you are. Don't let your genitalia determine what you are. In Scotland, at the age of four, a four-year-old child can go to school and turn around and um, say, let's say it's a little boy called Timmy. He can now turn around and say to the school teacher, I'm not a boy, I'm a girl. I want to dress up in girls' clothes and I want to be called Tabitha. And the school have to, if you like, um, entertain that, that four-year-old have to take that and enforce and they don't even need parental consent to do that but when you've got an education system that's supporting that four-year-old child's worldview and the, the the children in that school um its peers will also be supporting enforcing that worldview so instead of referring to timmy as timothy he'll be called tabitha because that's what he wants to be called or she wants to be called the only people who are, who are not going to accept that are the parents so what does that undermine as far as parental authority is concerned for the child if its world views are going to be enforced by the school system and the state yeah. Yeah. there's a question the from the doza how does transgenderism promote evolution it does not it merely undermines it the biblical order it, 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 when you think about it right um just going away from the um the four-year-old subjective point of view of their own identity heterosexuality doesn't need LGBTQI drag maps. I LGBTQI drag maps requires 
heterosexuality. Isn't that an irony? Because if everybody in the world today became LGBTQI drag maps, I think within the generation there'll be no human beings left. What does that tell you about biology? which makes sense. But the thing is, is that you're not finding the atheist argue with any of this because, because there is no objective moral value. This is why all of this stuff is creeping in. So that goes back to what I was saying about the 30s and the 40s, when no matter what religion you believed in, those objective moral values served as a bulwark against these influences that will slow, that would, yeah. would have slowly try to, to creep in. But when you remove theology and its objective moral values, you have to replace it with something and woke is what's replaced those objective moral values, where now you've just got this rampant mass confusion as to what is real and what isn't real. Right. I'm just going to make a few points from the from the slideshow that I'm busy working on. I'll be working on this tomorrow and Sunday, um, my new slide deck on Darwin. I said I have all the notes written out. Um, this might not seem like a lot, but it's actually a pile of notes that runs down to the bottom here. And then I have to... So that's, what the, that's part two that I have to do. Part one is roughly done. So... Um, but... Darwinism devalued human life, right? So the debate over the significance of social Darwinism in Germany is very important because this gives us background to discussions of Hitler's ideology and the roots of German imperialism in World War I. They're very, very, Darwin's views are very much related to that. Now, Hitler was a social Darwinist, right? And he viewed history as a struggle for existence amongst unequal races. The inferior races needed to be eliminated and all Hitler's scholars agree, agree on this point. And it is too obvious to deny when you read Mein Kampf. Hitler was a social Darwinist. Darwinism impacted thinking about the value of human life and the significance of death. And as predicted, Darwinism led to the worst genocides in, the, in history, in the 20th century, by people who Marx was an avid Darwinist. And the Soviets, I mean, murdered hundreds of millions, right? Now, prominent German Darwinists urged their society to reevaluate its stance on today what is known as biomedical ethics, which are infanticide, euthanasia, su suicide, and abortion. Don't forget, the Nazis implemented infanticide, euthanasia, right? And yeah, the French Revolution atheists, especially under Marquis de Sade, they promoted abortion. This goes back to so these are atheist ideas: infanticide, euthanasia, suicide, and abortion are atheist ideas. You remove morality and this is what you get. You devalue human life. So instead of being made in the image of God, you are just clay, you know, meat, whatever. So leading Darwinists invoked Darwinian science to undermine traditional Christian ethical values. Darwin was aware of this, but um, he, as I said, he designed it knowingly to undermine biblical morality. So this is what's going to be part of what I'll be discussing in this series going forward. <clears throat> and you notice um, yep. there was something else as well. Didn't they do um, where they were forced sterilizations as well on people they considered imbeciles so that they didn't breathe? So if there are people are born in a particular um, environment, poor environment, or they were medically unsound, or they were alcoholics or um, drug addicts, they would they would forcibly sterilize people. I think that also happened in America as well. Correct. And Vegetal says here, without God, the only moral code would be might makes right. And that's exactly what we saw. Post-Darwinism, yep. right? This is exactly what happened. This is what I'll be discussing in this talk as well. Um, this will be a fairly lengthy series as well. This is just the introduction, these slides here. Uh, the first 23 is the introduction. I'm still busy working on fleshing out the other slides. Like, I still have to clean all this up and, you know, so on, and then add additional data here. But but this is the first set, and then the second set's going to be longer, and there's more as well to discuss the moral issues. So, yeah, I mean, Darwinism led to immorality, on a, on a, to murder on a massive scale. It enabled the devaluing of people, saying, well, those people are not as good as us, and they are holding back the human race, kill them. That's That's really what happened. Um, Harry L. Johnson makes a point, Satan the devil wants to destroy mankind. That was the other biblical point I wanted to raise. That some, sadly to say, that um, adhere to the um, biblical narrative find them uncomfortable talking about. And I've actually heard them say this, that they, they think that the Satan is not real. It is um, a phrase that they um, that was concocted because they didn't have um, words for mental, uh, what was it, schizophrenia or any kind of mental illness. So Satan is some kind of word to, if you like, um, 
suggest that meant it was actually mental illness and not the devil. But that's kind of ironic because Genesis chapter three, verses one to five clearly talks about something was happening there, which we get an answer to Revelation. Uh, is it 12, seven or 12, nine? First John five nineteen says the whole world is lying in the power of the wicked one. When Jesus was baptized, who was it that led him away and tried to tempt him three times? Then you got the book of Job chapter one, where Satan enters before what you call it, um, God himself, and over the uh, argument over the challenge of Job's integrity. Then you have uh, Paul saying that Jesus came to break the works of the devil. So you can't disclude the fact that from the biblical narrative, these fallen angels, Satan and his horde of fallen angels, are actually in opposition to God. So when we are looking at the philosophies of what we see in the world today, it isn't just the invention of men. There's something more going on here that is a direct attack of the Bible. So this goes back to when God says something like, um, life is precious. You know, David saying, you, you know, you saw the embryo of me. And now we're living in a world that says, well, abortion is, you know, it's just another form of contraception or it's it's just a clump of cells. Who's thinking, are we really, are they really adopting or manifesting there? When God says in the beginning, I created a male and female, and now you're living in a world that says, no, a four-year-old child can decide what sex they are. And if a 16-year-old girl wants to have a double mastectomy, there's nothing wrong with that. And yet there, even that is kind of like, I mean, as perverted as it is, let's look at the change in mental attitude. In the 80s, I don't know what it was like in South Africa or Poland or in America, but in England in the 80s and the 90s, I think particularly what brought it forward was the death of uh, Karen Carpenter, the singer of the Carpenters, because she suffered from anorexia and bulimia. Yeah. Now, nobody will have suggested that anorexia or bulimia, okay, was a normal condition. Everybody recognized it, though the, word, the phrase wasn't touted at the time, but it was body image dysphoria. You wouldn't go up to somebody that's got that suffers from bulimia or anorexia say hey I have a couple of hunger suppressants that'll sort you out or do you want some no. liposuction today you wouldn't do that yet today they're prepared to form a double mastectomy on a 16 year old girl on the whim that clearly has mental issues yeah. not body, with the body image dysphoria this is the just, world that we're living in go on. just pause a second if you would thunderous so I want to bring, just bring attention to um this is the book by Margaret Sanger, Woman and the New Race. All right, Woman and the New Race by Margaret Sanger. And this is a quote from the book. The most merciful thing that the large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. I will drop this link in the chat. So, so this, is what, this is what atheism has led to. This is what um, Darwinism and eugenics has led to. So your thoughts on that, what you see here? Well, 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 are, are we not? It's almost like when the Canaanites were sacrificing their children to Molech. Uh, uh, abortion seems to be the scientific version of that sacrifice that we're living in. The world yes, it today. is. Uh, and that, it certainly is. Yes, it is sacrifice to Molech. Yes. You know, so we have to look at things from a spiritual level, from the biblical narrative. What are we seeing in the Bible that has been replicated today, but somehow it's, it's been grafted on in a very different way, but it's still the same thing, but somehow it appears different. And you're seeing that the, the sacrifices to Molech and abortion, what's the difference? There is no difference. The one is just scientific sacrifice to Molech. But scientific, but the, um, there's no science behind it. It's the science without science. Yeah, of course, I mean it's just it's just a word they use, right? It's just a word. So it's just what they what they claim it to be. You know, so we, when you're moving forward as well in time from say the 30s and 40s, we've also seen. I mean, family, as far as the biblical narrative is concerned, is very important. Um, all the families, they were encouraged to say families. I mean, God in the Bible clearly wants families to stay together. But since the, the decline of um, objective theistic moral values in society, are we not seeing now where where there are no such things as families anymore, or families now are being reduced, where marriage, rather than being a lifelong commitment, people are, prenups are part of the vernacular now. You know, it's part of the process that when you can, if you're going to get married, um, have a prenup sorted. Well, what's the point getting married if you've got the divorce sorted? What's the point getting married if the divorce is already settled before you're married? Isn't that already telling you that your, your, your marriage is going to be doomed to failure or it's going to have a failure? So just in case or, when, or just as when it does fail, we've already got the back doors open. 
So we're seeing very much everything that God, I mean, I think it's in Malachi 2.16 where it says God hates divorce. He hates it. Yet the world mm -hmm. says, have a prenup. Have the, have the divorce sorted before you get married. Or, you know, having an affair is just a euphemism for infidelity. Well, Jesus said, you know, he looks in the woman who's supposed to have a passion for, has already committed adultery in his heart. But the world through soap operas and such things almost makes these kind of acts of infidelity look attractive. They look exciting. It'll spice up your marriage. The world is totally opposite. And this is all because you've removed objective theistic moral values and you've replaced it with Darwin or atheism. This is what's caused the breakups of society today. Right. Actually, I want to show everyone this. Uh, Thunderous, have you seen this quote? This is from Oxford Academic. Uh, it's, it's a publication called the American Historical Review, which is um, published here with Oxford. It's also featured in the National Library of Medicine. And it's it's a, an article on Martin Luther's body, the stout doctor and his biographers by historian Lyndall Roper. And just could you read that for us, uh, Thunderous? Mm -hmm. It says that he wrote to his friend George Spalatin during his uh, stay in Wartburg um, by turns asking him for laxatives and entrusting him with his manuscripts or when, in some of his very last letters to his wife, he described his inability to be sexually aroused by the sight of prostitutes and blamed, blamed Jews for his illness. So you just mentioned How prostitution and uh, infidelity to your wife. Say again. Is uh, sexually aroused by the sight of prostitutes and blamed Jews for his illness. Yeah, but didn't you say that, you know, thou shalt not commit sexual immorality? Jesus said that. Yeah. It's and, in the Sermon on the Mount. And also, um, just for the, <laughs> this is Lax Luther. <laughs> Laxatives, <laughs> Lax Luther. <laughs> but besides that, um, so Luther was unable to be aroused by the sight of prostitutes. Now, now here's the thing. You walk. Is he was Luther walking down the street looking at prostitutes, or was Luther looking at prostitutes? You know, if you get my drift, right? And then he got on Tinder. Say again, please. He got on Tinder. Your, your your connection broke up. Say again, please. He was probably looking at prostitutes via Tinder or Pornhub. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, all yeah, Luther, all three hundred and thirty pounds of him, and. Here's the, here's the issue. So I discovered this yesterday. Um, according to a medical diagnosis based on some new documents were discovered about Luther, um, one of these was a letter from his doctor. And they described at length some of his symptoms. So I've just discovered this yesterday after I found these notes that Luther didn't get it up when he was looking at prostitutes. And of course, you could argue, well, you know, Luther was just walking down the street ogling. Okay, maybe that's a bad thing. No, no, no. Maybe it's a little bit more because tell me something, Thunderous. How do you get syphilis? Do you get syphilis from, I don't know, chewing bubble gum? No. Um, isn't that what Al Capone had as well? Isn't that something to do with being sexually promiscuous? We don't know. In Luther's case, you know, it's probably special. But but how would, let's just say that the, the, the medical diagnosis based on the symptoms is that Luther, Martin Luther, very possibly had syphilis. So I'm, I'm going to guess now, if you guys can give me three guesses, does one get syphilis from A, falling down the stairs, B, um, eating bananas, C, sleeping with prostitutes? Please drop your answer. A, falling downstairs. B, eating. Can I phone a friend? Or can I take a <laughs> yes, yes, you may, as long as you can put them on speakerphone so we can hear what they say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to call you. I'm going to call you. So I'll be talking about all this as soon as I can verify all of these things. But this one's legit. This one's legit. The, the doctor, the, this, this, this doctor or these group of doctors le legitimately think that based on the symptoms described in this newly discovered material, Martin Luther had syphilis. Now, does that put a different spin on this discussion of prostitutes, Thunderous? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Just, just thought I'd, I'd throw that in there. So, Lax Luther, Dr. Syphilis. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> thanks. Back to your discussion. Yeah. So, um, really, with, with you know, 
when you're looking at the world today, because they've removed the, the objective theistic moral values from society, and, and I keep using that phrase, object, objective theistic moral values, because I'm trying to generalise mm -hmm. the society irrespective of every any kind of denominational value. I'm just using it as a generalisation that when society had a God belief system, families were strong, communities were strong, the neighbourhood was strong, and it also self-governed as well but now that you know we've removed of all or, or, or removed all these things one only has to look out the window particularly in damaging children we now have a situation where men are encouraged to be grafted into the school education system so that they can serve not just the school teachers but also serve as like a surrogate father for the child that doesn't have the father at home which is becoming kind of like a feature of society today where siblings have half sibling brothers or sisters and you know where mummy has probably two or three children by two or three different men you know where we've got a drug addiction we've got a rising um suicide we've got mm -hmm. um, a rising crime we've got a rising feral behavior and this is the, and the, the irony is that the atheist turns around and says that the god belief is stupid and foolish. You know, they use pejoratives like sky daddy and such. Well, let's look at the window. Let's look out the window today, son. Let's look at your world in your image. Would you honestly say when looking back, you know, 50 years as to what society was like in comparison to, forget the science, just look at the morality. 50 years ago today, what did science look, uh, what did um, society look like? Then move forward today and let's look at society today. Which one had more th objective theistic moral values? Look how it governed itself. And let's look at today with the removal of objective theistic moral values. Look at, let's look at the amoral world that is atheistic and Darwinian as its scientific foundation. And tell me which one is the better world that you'd rather live in, in comparison. Think That's I would, where you have to look at the woke. I mean, do you want to work in live in woke um, Seattle, you know, where you've got these ten cities cropping up and it's this? No, I don't. Um, I mean, look, you look at Poland. Um, as you know, Poland's a Catholic country, and as you know, Catholicism is Satanism, and Poland is a very peaceful country, incredibly peaceful, family-oriented, safe place, you know, despite following Satanism. So, yeah, I mean, I think I would rather have a religious community, you know, than uh, than the woke. And I mean, you see what's happening with the crazy wokeness and other other crazy ideologies in the rest of the world, like in France, for instance. And the problem is as well. So when you're looking at um, moral values that are theistic in origin, they tend to stand as law for millennium, you know. You don't change things like, um, let's look at the Ten Commandments. They won't change from the time that they're instituted to the time that um, they're no longer required. And that's when God removes them himself. But society that's amoral and doesn't have any objective moral values, they're fickle and capricious. So they're changing all the time as to what is right and what is wrong. You've only got to look at today, for instance, and no one's taken away the humanity of any individual that's, you know, that's involved with the LGBTQI drag maps. They're all human beings and they're all made in God's image. Right. But even within that movement of LGBTQI drag maps, you'll find that the LG, LGB are now wanting to move away from the rest of them. So even that um, alphabet salad is being fragmented because with the LGB, when, mm. when it was with pride, they wanted to be just recognized as normal human beings. They weren't trying to promote homosexuality. They mm. were just wanted to be recognized as normal human beings. Look, we, we have this, if you like, uh, inclination, but we're just normal human beings. We're, we're not yeah. different and we want to be yeah, respected. But, That's all it was. But now they're coming for your kids because th that was just the tip of the spear. That was just yes. that was just the the soft sell, but now the real agenda is is exposed, because that was just how can I say using that was the wedge, to open the door. And now they've pried it open, and now the crazies who actually run the show, they are exposing this agenda. Um, you know, this I, is this we're I, seeing I, now. It's gaining more power. I, I, I think there's probably very few people who haven't seen Matt Walsh's um, "What Is a Woman." The, the documentary that he did a year or two ago. 
I mean, that should show people how insane the our argument is as to what is a woman, where nobody dare answer what, 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 what is a woman, what constitutes what is a woman, or a biological woman. That should show you how, how stupid the argument is. So when you're looking at the, um, the fragmentation of this, you, you've only got to look at saying, you know, I keep using the word drag, and some people are probably thinking, well, why are you using the word drag in this? What's that got to do with the LGBTQI? Well, you've only got to look at, and I'll be uploading this on my channel, Drag Queen Storytime. I know it takes place in America, mm. and I know it takes place in England. Have you heard of it, Lloyd? Of course, yeah. Of course I have. Of course, drag, that is men dressed up in sexually provocative clothing. For those who don't know, men who dress up in sexually provocative clothing and go into schools and libraries reading stories to toddlers and infants under the, under the guise of diversity and inclusivity. There's the images. And this is said to be normal and nothing wrong with it. Um, this is clearly satanic. This is a perversion. I mean, this is a genuine perversion. And... And yeah, this is this is normalizing perversity. I mean, look at this. And this is so, so, so. Where's the out, where's the outrage of the atheist in this? They call people who believe in um, religion as brainwashed. But what's this? People who believe in a god are brainwashed. What on earth is this? Is this what normal? Is but the the problem. But for the problem for the atheist is he can't use um, his periodic table to turn around and say this is wrong. Because all of this comes from his world. Yeah, but hold on. If atheism is a lack. Them. If atheism is a lack of. Actually, I do have a, a, a presentation I've been working on on exactly this, but I'll do it out of memory for the moment. But atheists claim that atheism is a lack of belief. If it is a lack of belief, it is. It is not as knowledge. It's not. It's not a. It's not a knowledge claim because a lack of belief is just effectively an emotional state. So. An emotional state holds no knowledge value, it just is. So how can they claim that atheism is then scientific, right? So, so this, this makes no coherent sense. It is not scientific, it is merely... And also, if you claim you have a lack of belief, now for instance, you might not believe in something you don't know about. However, once the mind has been exposed to that stimulus, for instance, you didn't believe in bananas. It's the 1500s. And they've just come back from India for the first trip to India with bananas to Europe. You didn't know about bananas, so you lacked a belief. Granted, you were an atheist as far as bananas were concerned. Now you see a banana. Someone shows you a banana. Do you now lack a belief? No, you do not. Because once you've been exposed to the stimuli, you now either accept it or reject it. You now don't have a neutral position of a lack. You now have chosen to either reject what you see or to accept it. So therefore, a lack of belief is only valid if you have had no knowledge and no exposure to something. But once you're exposed yeah. to it, you now you now have made a decision to either accept it or reject it, in which case you actively reject what you see or you actively accept what you see. So again, atheists do not follow logic. And also, if you read through the literature, the scientific literature, science barely, barely, 2-3% of it, say that, look, well, this is a valid belief of atheism. No, the literature states atheism is an active set of beliefs, an active set of doctrines and philosophies. Did that make sense, Thunderous? <clears throat> Absolutely makes sense. Absolutely makes sense. And, and just to continue on from, from the drag point, you and I have discussed this before about what MAPS is. I mean, map, before there was MAPS, there was paedophilia. But now they've, they've used, um, they've lowered, softened the impacts of that word by using maps. And maps is just an abbreviation of minor attracted persons. Actually, so no, yeah. So they're trying to use map, which is, a, as far as I can tell, is a minor attracted pedophile. They have yeah. fixed it for them, map. Yeah. So now, so you really have to ask the question because you see that from there, you can see it from their point of view because they're not suggesting that it's wrong because if there is no objective moral value and there's nothing beyond the periodic table, then everything is nothing more than a chemical equation of what's acting in your, in your physiological brain. So can you actually condemn a human being for acting out? Because in their, in their model, um, of uh, Darwin and atheism, and it's on my channel there. There's no such thing as free will. Richard Dawkins, there's two videos there um, of Richard Dawkins admitting there's no such thing as free will. 
it's just based with chemicals or you subjectively invent something i wanted to go through one of those maybe we can do it next time and do a yeah. stop and play a discussion yeah. as to how deceptive um richard dawkins is by uh, saying everything but answering nothing yeah. okay um yeah. So, so, and I'll give an example of the stupidity of um, the arguments of um, the, the, the LGBTQ movement. And one person turned around and said to me, oh, well, yeah, but homosexuality is natural. So my cat and I goes, well, what makes you think it's natural? Because it doesn't produce offspring. There's no biological reason for a human being to consume the semen of another man. There's no value in that. Also, there's no value in the ejaculation of semen into another man's anus. Well, what is the what is the Darwinian evolution reason for any of these things? And then they quote it's all like certain animals that behave in a certain way. What they don't understand is animal instincts of alpha male, so on and so forth. All right. Well, I thought to myself, hang on a minute here. If you're going to cite nature as your defense for practices that don't produce offspring, well, what's your view on cannibalism? Because cannibalism is more prevalent than homosexuality. What's your view on rape? because rape is more prevalent than homosexuality. Are you just going to suggest now that cannibalism and rape are normal as well? Because in your worldview, you've just cited the animal kingdom for the, for the practice yeah. of homosexuality. Why are you then going to condemn these two? And what is well, your objective moral? Well, well, if I can make a point on that, um, Bog Katie um, says, Bog isn't, the, isn't the correct term pederasty? Um, pedophilia is the attraction to minors. Pederasty is the practice when older man sort of mentors but sexually uses a teenager, so a kid above the age of about twelve. So, so they they are slightly different. They they are similar, but they they're not identical. So, pederasty was typically what was practiced, I believe, or what was actually abhorrent within Greece. It's assumed it was, but actually it was spoken out against. But this is what some people tried to practice. So, pederasty is a little bit different. Um, so they're not quite the same, to my knowledge. And then also, if you look at atheism and you look at the survival of the fittest, right? Slavery would also be logical because we have machines to make our lives easy. And if it's the, the strong versus the weak and you, you then, and the powerful versus the weak, right? Then it makes sense that you enslave others because this means that your life is easier. You are more likely to survive because you are getting work done and you can spend more time procreating or shooting pool or whatever it is, having others do the hard labor. So then slavery would be a logical extension of, of where atheism and Darwinism, social Darwinism would lead. Yeah, because there's, there's nothing wrong. There is no right and wrong. There's no good and bad, and there's no good or evil either. There just simply yes. is. And all everything is a sum total of chemical reactions within the human being brain. That's all there is. There's nothing beyond that. Agreed. So um, we've discussed this before, actually. I have in my, my talk on the cult of reason, on atheism, and, um, and what's his name? Um, Dawkins. I mean, this is something I have discussed in the past with Dawkins. So, yeah, he doesn't believe in free will, and so do so. There are many, many that also do not. Um, yeah, they can't though. That's the thing. You see, um, the moment that they say they cite free will as a reality, then it's, 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 it's the it's the paradox in the Book of Genesis, where the tree of life, or, or um, no, not the tree of life, the tree of knowledge and good and bad, was the determination and proof of free will. It was either obedience or disobedience without law the, the paradox is without law there is no free will without without free will there is no law free will is the demonstration of being obedient to law if you don't have the law then all you have is instinct that's why god put the the tree of knowledge good bad in the garden of eden it was adam's demonstration of his free will whether to be obedient or to be disobedient and yeah. he demonstrated it via free will and you know, a says tree, here that uh, not Darwin, this is Dawkins. He claims here, he states here bluntly, when I think I have free will, when I think I'm exercising free choice, I am deluding myself. My brain states are determined by physical events. He's a mechanical um, determinist. So he is a mechanical <laughs> determinist, which means that, now it's, it's very interesting that they claim that their beliefs are mechanically determined then why are they adamantly dead set against the vast majority of humans 
who were inclined by nature to be religious. Why are they claiming that we are the faulty ones when we are the majority and they are the ones that are the, the utter minority and clearly the defective ones? And if, if, it's, if you have no control over your brain state and your beliefs, then why are they giving us grief about it? Because we have no control over that either. Well, this goes back to what I was trying to say earlier. Well, where did the belief of God come from then? If there is no God and there is no Jesus and there is no Satan and there are no demons and there are no angels and there's nothing beyond the material, then Dawkins has to blame evolution for people to believe that are believing in God in the first place because they wouldn't believe in a God unless evolution allowed them to believe in that concept in the first place. So where right. else can Dawkins believe that God came from? If God does not exist, where else did he come from? He could have only come from evolution because evolution produces human beings to believe God in the first place. So he's condemning evolution, the very thing he believes in. Yeah, I know. And I mean, Vegetal asks a very good question. Why then does Dawkins blame Christians for anything if he doesn't believe they have free will? Because they are hypocrites, because their, their, their worldview is not coherent. It is not logical. It doesn't follow logic. It rejects rational logic. So it, it, it's got nothing to do with logic at all. So yeah, Thunderous, we've been going nearly 90 minutes. We should wrap up in the next five. Yeah, Vegetal Asbestos. Do you think you can decide to put that tie on that day or not? Answer me that. Do you think he made that decision? I think Dawkins has also been married three times. It seems strange yes. for a guy that um, doesn't believe in God, right? Doesn't believe in God, yet he goes and gets married three times. And religion, uh, marriage is a religious ceremony. I mean, it originates in the Bible. It's a God-instituted arrangement. So why would the guy that doesn't believe in God go and practice three times with three different women something that God instituted in the first place. Do we not see that as being a bit hypocritical or contradictory? I know they and don't. He hasn't I mean, produced I'll... any sons, has he? He hasn't produced any male offspring. It's kind of been a failure in evolutionary terms as well, hasn't he? Correct, correct. But I mean, this is, um, I wonder, I, um, actually, I want to, uh, yeah, so I want to show something. Um, What's your next point? Because I'm busy looking up something while you... Um... Well, I think to be honest with you, um, you're going to wrap up in a few minutes. Uh, what I was going to ask um, the audience is, um, we, you and I mentioned something um, last week or the week before, of maybe having a, a, a live discussion show where people can contact us, ask questions on um, Darwinian evolution or atheism or Islam. Um, I just thought maybe is it worth putting it out to the audience whether they'd be interested in having that as a feature or maybe once yeah. a fortnight, so once a month. Every, yeah, every couple of weeks or so once a month having just a Q&A session, just, a, just an open Q&A session. Uh, we'll let you know about it and then we'll just have a chat about things. We'll take questions, try to have answers. So uh, I'll put up a little post on the community. And uh, today was, was, was really just an open session, th thunderous this time. But I'll put it up and then post your questions and we can try and, and tackle some of those questions and have a discussion around that. Um, yeah, because then and then also Monday, I'm going to try to do a, um, a show. Hopefully, I'll have some notes ready for Monday. I've got some things to talk about. And then also on Tuesday, I will be on air with um, Kennedy Hall, very possibly doing a live stream with Kennedy Hall uh, at the Kennedy Report. But yeah, it looks like people are keen on, on, a, on, a, on a show, Thunderous, so we can definitely uh, plan one. So maybe let's look yeah, at what I, would, yeah. what I would like to do in the show is, um, particularly with the people in the audience, is actually tackle Darwinian evolution, because that is where my skill set is, is Darwinian evolution and the arguments, um, thrown arguments against why Darwinian evolution is absolutely, totally, irrefutably impossible to have okay. taken place. Now, I've heard you do that's great talks with, uh, with uh, Thaddeus on that topic. That, that's not my strong point. I mean, I'm just getting into that now with my talks on um, Darwin, you know, which I'll be doing. So, yeah. Uh, the last um, Kennedy Hall was not says, live, uh, horse. Yeah, yeah sorry. And, uh, and, and Mr. T, Thaddeus, if you're out there, I'm still waiting for a response because Thaddeus and myself are supposed to be doing um, a show with reference to Khadija and Khadija being the true source of Islam. And that's how Islam got started. Without Khadija, there is no sin. And that is the yeah. standard Islamic. The next YZ says, can I ban Danny if he shows up for chats? I mean, look, I have no interest in Danny's opinions. If you want to ban him, please go ahead. I, I don't, honestly, what, what, is he, what does he offer that's of value to me that, you know, I'm not interested in his story. I, I've rejected his story. I have my story to tell. And, and we're not here to entertain people who are trying to undermine us. Your job is to tell your story, to tell a better story. 
and not to give a platform to people who are trying to destroy you. <laughs> yep. So yeah, so we, shall we call it, we wrap it up here, Thunderous? Yep. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for um, being as part of the audience this, uh, this evening and for anybody that's going to be watching it later on and making comments later on. Um, certainly appreciate your input. And if you've got any suggestions, then uh, please put them in the chat and uh, or the comments and uh, I'll have a look at them and uh, respond to them. All right. No, so thank you. Thanks very much, Thunders, for coming on. So, guys, I hope uh, you had a good time and that you learned something. Um, obviously, we threw out some little tidbits here and there, so hopefully these things are helpful. Uh, the stuff on Margaret Sanger, I'll be looking deeper into that as well to give us an understanding of where Darwinism led. These are people influenced. Marx was heavily influenced by Darwinism. Hitler was heavily influenced by Darwinism, as well as the whole culture in Germany prior to him was heavily influenced by Darwinism. And it is, it is toxic. Darwinism is a toxic ideology. Ideas have consequences, and they want to tell you it's just scientific. No, it is not scientific. It is genocidal. So that's my last thought. I'll leave the last word to you, Thunders. No, thank you, Lloyd, for um, just, uh, having an opportunity to meet up with you again uh, this Friday evening. And I thank the audience as well. And hopefully we can come together in a couple of weeks' time or something and um, look at uh, doing a live show or, uh, with a live call-in or live questions and answers. Excellent. We'll do that. So thank you, everyone. God bless. See you soon. Have a great weekend. Good night.